Maria Graviero from eLife. Um, thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. And thank you very much for um, the invitation to speak at this event. It has been really exciting so far. And it has been great also to see eLife featured in so many of the talks. Uh, so thank you very much for, for all the mentions. Uh, so I was asked to talk about the work we're doing in eLife to make the components of research accessible and discoverable. But just before I start, I would like to um, just say a few words about the work we do. So eLife is a nonprofit organization uh, led by researchers for science and for scientists. We have the kind support of these four funding bodies, the AGGMI, the Wellcome Trust, the Max Planck Society, and the World War Foundation. Uh, in our first few years, we dedicated our efforts to establish eLife as an open access journal for the life and biomedical sciences, but we also do a lot of work around innovation and technology, especially in towards supporting the development of open source tools. So I will also be uh, saying a few words about that uh, more towards the end of my, my talk today. Um, so before I talk about the work we're doing, I would like to just quickly go through the reasons why we should uh, encourage open science behaviors, although I believe that all of you will confirm and agree with what I'll say, and then I'll go through the, the work we're doing. Um, so um, I guess that there are various reasons why one uh, should support open science and, and do the be all our best to make the research components accessible and discoverable. One, uh, one reason being that obviously this is of great benefit uh, to scientists and uh, the, whole, um, the whole community. Uh, additionally, uh, this helps advance science, uh, increases peer validation and uh, the, the checking of uh, scientific facts. And one other um, main motivation to make the research components accessible and discoverable, and when I speak about components of research, I'm thinking here obviously at the, as it, uh, in the traditional um, research article, but also the underlying code, software, uh, data, uh, data, and materials, for example. Uh, so one of the other motivations to uh, make all these components accessible and discoverable are, of course, vendor mandates. And this has been um, discussed already today. So just to give you, for example, um, um, some recent news. So as of last month, uh, 13 funding bodies in Europe have mandated that research they publish not only needs to be made available in open access, but needs to be released under the pure or immediate open access model. So it will be really interesting to see how this shifts behaviors uh, in, in, European, uh, in, in European research. Um, additionally, there has been increasing, um, I increasing um, encouragement from funding, funding bodies to not only make um, publications available in, in, in open access and, and the most progressive uh, lessons, but also to make the components of research such as data and code available. And this is something that, for example, the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK has also started encouraging so that when uh, researchers apply for funding, they do not only need to provide, for example, a data management plan, but they also need to provide a plan on how they will uh, make the, the source and the data uh, and all the, the rest of the outputs uh, available after, uh, after the, the publication. Um, so now just to say a few words about uh, the work we're doing in eLife. So thinking of the kind of more traditional component of research, the article itself, as I mentioned, we are an open access journal, so all our content <coughs> is published under a, either under CC by attribution license or under a public domain dedication. Uh, all content is available as ready at the point of publication with no embargoes. Um, because we are online only, we can take full advantage of the digital uh, environment. So we do not impose any number of, uh, we do not have a limit for the number of figures one can display, supplements or videos. And in the interest of discoverability, each one of these individual components get assigned their DOI so they can <coughs> be cited in their own right. Um, regarding data, uh, it has already been mentioned today, the FAIR principle, so we also follow these guidelines. So data should be findable, accessible, and interoperable, and reusable, uh, both for humans and machines. So with this in mind, uh, when researchers submit a manuscript to eLife, uh, we ask that all data sets associated with the <coughs> eLife publication to be made available. Unless, of course, there are strong reasons that may hinder so, such as in the case of uh, data uh, on, on human subjects, for example. 
Um, we also ask for the data to be clearly documented and all the procedures that were used to collect and generate the data to be clearly outlined in the methods section of the manuscript. Uh, we recently started asking authors to provide the data availability statement. So this is something that other journals do as well, so such as, for example, Clause or F1000. And uh, this is kind of a prompt or an encouragement for authors to disclose which data they have collected and where it can be found. Uh, the data availability statements, as well as the uh, any consulted or newly generated data sets, are tagged as such in the XML, which uh, which in, in encourages interoperability with the, with, for example, data aggregators. And the data sets are also cited in the references list. Um, in terms of code, as another component for research, uh, we ask authors to also provide. The any analysis scripts or custom code they have developed, uh, they can do so by uploading the source code files with the with the submission. Uh, but we mainly encourage authors to deposit the code to a dedicated software platform. So, for example, GitHub, GitHub, GitLab, or other version control platform. Um, also, um, as of like a year or so, we've started forking authors' codes when they have deposited the code to um, a Git-based repository. And this allows us to keep kind of a version of the code as it was at the point of publication, while the authors can still carry on and develop uh, their own work using their own GitHub repositories. And also, um, then a, a link to the, to the author's own repository um, as well as the, the commit number and the location is included as a full uh, reference in the references list. <coughs> in terms of materials and resources, which we can consider as another important component of scholarly research, uh, obviously as uh, most uh, publishers, we ask authors to document in the article uh, the materials and resources that were collected and indicate how they can be provided other academic re researchers in case they want to replicate the procedures or analyze them or reuse the materials. Uh, whenever possible, these should be deposited to dedicated repositories uh, and as for the community standards. And as of, uh, similarly to what other um, publishers do, as well as um, following, for example, the encouragement of funding bodies like the NIH, ELIFE uh, encourage authors to use these research resource identifiers or RRID, so they are unique searchable identifiers, just like, for example, we've got the OS for publications, um, and these are for, for example, antibodies or cell lines that have been used for the course of research. Uh, still in mind um, of the availability and discoverability of uh, materials and resources, uh, we ask our authors, uh, when they reach the stage, uh, the stage of revised submission, to complete this key resources table where authors can outline the main and critical materials that they've used for within the scope of their research. Uh, so you can see an example on your right. Uh, so these will usually accommodate information about um, streams, software databases, and whenever possible, uh, authors should also provide the RRID uh, if there is one available. And this does not only promote discoverability, but also we think that it's a good encouragement towards reaching standardization in terms of reporting. Um, another component I would like to uh, mention today are protocols. Um, so um, you, most of you may be familiar with BioProtocol, the peer review journal. So we encourage submission um, to BioProtocol at any point before or after acceptance. So for example, on the two figures on your right, uh, you can see an example of an eLife paper that uh, then had two step-by-step -step protocols published in uh, BioProtocol. And then to recognize this, uh, we issued a new version of the article with the DOIs for the publications and also added two public annotations that you can see on the image on the top. And on the BioProtocol side of things, um, they also included a link to the eLife publication uh, towards, uh, with the objective of a, a increasing discoverability of the, the, the publication that was associated with the protocol. Uh, if uh, you've deposited um, or uh, written a, a science method using protocols.io, we'll also encourage uh, that you include the DOI in the method section if you submit a manuscript to you. And oh, I thought that would take longer. That was really quick. Uh, finally, I would just like to say a few words about uh, 
project we currently have underway, and that kind of relates to a lot of things that have already been, been mentioned today towards um, encouraging the use of reproducible documents. So we're actually working with um, whole tail uh, in this project as well, and we have conversations underway. So um, the idea is that we would um, be able to develop a reproducible document uh, that would be supported by the publishing infrastructure. So what often happens with users that are already familiar, for example, with Jupyter notebooks or other kind of computational or reproducible documents is that when you reach um, the um, publishing infrastructure or when you go to a journal to submit, then you need to provide a flattened PDF. So you've spent a lot of time creating these enriched manuscript, but when, when you reach uh, the sub submission point, you can no longer kind of provide all that beautiful document you've worked on. And so with the reproducible document stack, our aim is to bring the components of research together, so the article, the code, and the data mainly, encapsulate everything for the authors and also for readers, and that would be able to go beyond the usual static view of the research article so that readers would be able to play with the code and data uh, and also that this would not only be something useful for people already familiar with notebooks, but also those that prefer the Excel and Word environments. Uh, so in specific, this entails kind of three lines of work. Uh, so uh, we are working on an authoring platform. Uh, obviously there are already a lot of authoring platforms that use reproducible uh, documents in a web kind of browser interface, uh, but we we needed to um, develop a new one so that the publishing infrastructure can then support this format. So the publishing infrastructure uses uh, JAX XML and we, would, we needed to, to provide something in the same format so that the online journals could then process the article. So uh, the image on your right is, is an example of um, our authoring tool. So that's something uh, that's work on the way that we're getting um, user testing and feedback on at the moment. Uh, the second line of work are, is <coughs> the creation of a container that would be able to accommodate uh, a set of multiple digital documents, so the article, the code, uh, and um, the data. And finally, we, as I mentioned, we are working on creating the old infrastructure so that uh, the paper can su be submitted in this format uh, from submission until publication. So this could be particularly helpful as well for reviewers so that when you have an article and a peer review, the review will be able to play with the data and code and manipulate it as they see fit. Uh, so if you're interested in following the project, you can go to that website and subscribe. And also if you're working on an open source tool yourself, feel free to get in touch with me at the end of the, of the session or to go to this website as we'd be really interested in hearing your ideas and see if we could provide any support uh, for your project. And that was me. Thank you very much. with the funders at the GMI. So the idea, as you, as you probably clearly outlined, was that we would invite authors to submit, and if the paper was deemed suitable to go through in, in that peer review, then we would be kind of committing to publish the article with the editor's decision letter and the peer review reports. Uh, so in the event that um, there were a clear, like big flaws outlined during the review process, the authors would still have the option to withdraw or they can decide how to address the review's concerns. And because all these correspondence is published with the article, the reader will have the chance to see how the authors decided to address the concerns. So we've received 305 submissions, so the pilot we intended to be for 300 papers. There are still a few, well most of them are still under review. Uh, we've published four articles 
so far, and we should be publishing the data and some of the results mainly about the initial submission or the triage stage in the next few weeks, so that kind of, well, our readers know, for example, what was the difference in terms of uh, encouragement rate for peer review comparing to the traditional paper, the papers that go th through the traditional workflow. So this is data that should be ready for all of you to read in, in the shortly. Will you decide whether or not that program will continue? Um, uh, we haven't <coughs> thought about that yet, but something that we may, may wish to do again, uh, because we may not be able to have enough data to kind of draw substantial conclusions on, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about this reproducible publication container. Uh, first, the uh, infrastructure, and second, uh, sort of the, the use cases for this. I mean, mm -hmm. is it just, uh, yeah, are you just putting the text into like a Docker container, or is there something expanded from there? Yeah, so the idea is that, and sorry, I, I realized that I didn't mention a few things that I wanted to. Um, so uh, the idea is that this could be, it would be a collaborative tool, and you would have a, a text kind of Visual visualization similar to what you can get with Word, but uh, and you would be able, for example, if you've written uh, your work using the Jupyter notebooks or our Markdown, we would have the infrastructure to, to support the conversion of those formats to this container that would then be needed for to submit the paper to 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 an article, uh, and we'll be supporting our MATLAB. And so the idea is that this would be a platform agnostic to the tools uh, or methodologies that we've used. Uh, and that could be ideally then also used by other publishers, so these would be entirely open source. So obviously it's a bold and ambitious project and we're working with various uh, partners. So uh, I didn't actually mention Substance and Stencil are the main companies, tech companies we're working on this and we have other people as I mentioned on the table also in the discussions. Hi. Um, I. I think your life is fantastic. We, we, I was thinking. Yeah, we, we published it and I thought it was really great how you guys really interact um, with the people who submit. My question is the following, now that you're saying that um, we're moving more forward to all the data and all the code, what is the burden on the reviewer? Are you expecting the reviewers to analyze the data? Uh, <laughs> I we, mean, that's a lot. <laughs> we know that that doesn't happen I, and I think that's just how science and, and kind of, it's, it's it, it's it's how things are done at the moment across the publishing ecosystem, so it's not e-life specific. But I think that with these document stacks, so the idea that would be able to see the code that's underlying the plot or a figure and be able to manipulate it, that actually that may may make the, the reviewers kind of work less complicated. So, so we know that there are a lot of really keen reviewers that actually download the data and go and process it and then feedback. But that's just a, a, a minority. So I think that with, with this reproducible document, reviews may, may be more inclined or, or more willing to, to review the code and the data. Um, I know that many journals are loath to sort of look at impact factors. I think eLife is one of those as well. So I'm curious what you guys think of as sort of better alternatives of evaluating the, su the success of articles and what you guys use as criteria for um, getting better uh, you know, citations or visitation of the website or what you guys use. Mm -hmm. So I in each one of the live articles, you can see the number of downloads or and page views that has received. And for example, we also encourage the use of other alternative metrics, such as the ones that you can see without metrics that have been mentioned before. So references in media outlets, Twitter, that's the type of, of recognition. Yeah, okay. feel free to well, yeah, yeah, feel free so, to well, carry. So the alt metrics, I feel like, um, it, it's like, that certainly seems to be, at this point, a little bit contaminated by like, these bots that kind of like send tweets out and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if there's like any other like more rigorous um, criteria or if it's just downloads and all metrics? Or um, so actually, yeah, so, so we do rely a lot on the editors themselves to make the judgment as whether the paper was good enough to be published. And we believe that's kind of enough recognition uh, and it's better than, for example, uh, uh, an AG index or an impact factor. So it was, I think, one early this morning that mentioned this, is that his AG index is actually 
quite low. And so obviously that's this metric as well as impact factor does not clearly kind of reflect all, all, all the other work you do in terms of reviewing. Uh, also, like for example, if you if you if you're an advocate of open science, you may be involved in a lot of open science initiatives, and that should also be taken into account, for example, when you apply for funding or tenure. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a change that we, we probably or I hope we'll see in the next few years, in, uh, not only in the publishing industry but also in terms of funding recognition and career recognition. Great. Do you have any more questions for Maria? Okay, and also Maria mentioned Protocols IO, and um, they are also here, and they'll be having a session tomorrow. So, if anybody's interested in learning more about that platform, uh, please feel free to join us. Next, I'd like to introduce Gabriel Gasquet from Aspire. Can you hear me well? Uh, well, uh, because I'm the second to the last, uh, I was told that I can take an hour. <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this really great symposium that has been uh, not only very interesting, but also invigorating. Uh, I was asked to give an overview of some of the initiatives that PLOS has either triggered or embraced to support and promote uh, open access and open science in general. And I will start uh, with a little bit of our roots and history. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with our role as uh, a nonprofit open access publisher, but we actually started as a advocacy organization and we see ourselves as innovators. Um, PLOS was founded in 2001, that is many, many years after the formation of the universe and the appearance of life on Earth. Uh, and in an open letter, we advocated for the establishment of, of an online library that will provide unrestricted access to the published scientific record because we honestly believe that it belongs to the public. Uh, and it wasn't until 2003 that PLOS uh, became a publisher and launched its first journal, PLOS Biology. Today, we publish now uh, seven journals, uh, covering mostly biology, but also medicine, physics, chemistry, engineering, and social sciences. So at PLOS, we're constantly revisiting the concept of open and see how we can expand its boundaries. So we're starting by advocating and promoting free and unrestricted access to published research. But have all, we have also taken steps to grant and promote access to raw data, 
to redefine the way that scientific contributions are assessed, including increasing transparency in peer review, and overall, we work to open up scientific communication to make it faster and more efficient, useful, and interconnected. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna describe some of the work that we have done to achieve these goals, starting with open data. So there is evidence that data availability from the authors declines by about 17% per year since publication, indicating that authors themselves are not great stewards of data. Conversely, there is also evidence that studies that make their underlying data available are more impactful. So what this graph shows is that for papers reporting microarray data, the number of citations are greater if the underlying data is available. So starting March of 2014, PLOS established a policy that required that all of our papers should provide the underlying data uh, within the legal and ethical restrictions via a third party repository. And during submission, our authors must provide a data availability statement that is published together with the paper and provide links to the data repositories. As of today, the PLUS journals have together published more than 100,000 papers with a data statement, and we have only rejected less than 0.1% of our submissions due to the author's unwillingness or inability to provide data. As I briefly mentioned before, we see many long-term benefits on data sharing via a third-party repository, uh, in addition of reducing the burden, burden on the author, it facilitates or it invites uh, independent uh, validation and reanalysis, re which in addition of uh, bolstering uh, reproducibility, it adds value to the research output. We also believe that authors should be given additional credit for sharing useful data. Uh, even though I feel that I'm preaching to the converter, in these slides I'm going to show you a cute example of how sharing data is a force of good. So for every paper that we publish, we do a promotion campaign that includes tweeting. So we use, uh, we tweeted about this article and somebody counter tweeting saying like, this, this article seems cool, but please do not use this graph for promoting it because it sucks. <laughs> so we challenge this person to come up with a better way of displaying the data since they were already available. So he came back with three alternatives and you might agree or disagree on the relative improvement. But the point is that once the data is available, it can be freely reused, reanalyzed and replotted for scientific or teaching purposes. We have also wondered in PLOS, how can we redefine the way that scientific contributions can be assessed while at the same time take a stance for reproducibility. And we know, we all know how science, how competitive science can be, particularly in certain hot topics, and how damning it can be when you get a scoop. So therefore, and considering this and the value of independent replication, the starting this year, Plus Biology specifically implemented a policy that we call complementary research policy that allows authors to submit a scooped paper within six months of publication of their competitor's work. And that previous paper won't be considered detrimental during our editorial assessment. Uh, this paper published in Genome Research at the beginning of this year shows first evidence that in vitro synthesized CRISPR guide RNAs can trigger an RNA sensing in 18 new responding human cells. One day after this paper came live online, we received this submission that reached the same conclusions. We sent it for full peer review, and it got published on July of this year, together with a perspective written by the senior authors of both publications, highlighting the value of independent replication. <laughs> Since our policy was implemented, we have received 10 complementary research articles, two of which have been published, Four are under active consideration and four have been rejected. 
We have also embraced uh, initiatives that other journals already roll out to increase transparency in peer review by publishing the review comments, the author's rebuttals, and all the decision letters. We believe that by making fully available the peer review process, we will increase reviewer and editorial accountability, provide a training opportunity for graduate students and postdocs about the peer review process, enhance the reader's understanding of the study in the current context of the field, and also create a pathway for crediting peer review, which currently doesn't happen. In the last slide, I will uh, mention a partnership that PLOS has established with the College Spring Harbor Laboratory and their preprint server for the biological fields, BioArchive. And as a result of this partnership, uh, any manuscript that is submitted for preprint posting in BioArchive can be directly directed or sent to PLOS for formal peer review. And other journals do that if the author wish to select a PLOS journal. Conversely, a manuscript that is first submitted to PLOS, any PLOS journal, for peer review will be offered the opportunity to preprint posting in BioArchive. And it will be the uh, PLOS staff personnel, the one who will do the initial screening to determine suitability of the manuscript for preprint posting. The editors will also use the comments delivered to the preprint server as part of the editorial assessment and authors can opt in or opt out. With that, um, I think that I made a case that PLOS has significantly contributed to open science by granted unrestricted access to the science that we publish together with the associated data, by redefining the way that scientific contribution is assessed, embracing transparency in peer review, and enhancing or speeding dissemination of the scientific output without compromising peer assessment. And with that, I will take some questions. You have probably 40 minutes. <laughs> I can be loud if you want. Um, I'm curious if at PLOS, or if people are aware other places, if there are uh, policies or procedures or programs to help like junior scientists who potentially can't pay. Like the people I know who are most excited about open access are also often early career scientists who don't have the ability to write in uh, funding for open, you know, fees into their grants. Um, and I'm, I know that there's often policies for people publishing from lower middle income countries and things like that. I don't know, if, I'm, I guess I'm curious if there's any discussion about ways to incentivize like junior researchers who maybe don't have uh, the ability to pay the fees to be able to get their foot in the door with uh, PLOS or other open access. Yes and no. So as you mentioned before, uh, PLOS has uh, three tiers. I'm, I'm an editor, so I work directly with the manuscript and I'm blind to all the financial procedures. So I never assess a paper based on the financial situation of the authors. That being said, I know that uh, PLOS has tiers and depending where the senior author of the paper comes from, the APC, which stands for author publication fee, uh, might be waived. Uh, that doesn't apply to any author in the States. Now, uh, we don't have a short answer on how to solve that issue, but we're actually looking on a radical way in which open access can thrive. And it's uh, not charging the authors directly, but considering science dis or dissemination of the scientific output as part of the scientific endeavor. So, we ideally, or we believe, that uh, paying for distribution should come from either the funding agencies or the universities. And this idea is not originally from PLOS, it's been circulated, but that's where we are headed. So we don't have a short answer for your concern, but I think in the long term, the way that open access is financed is gonna change. 
And it will depend, sorry, on the specific budget of each individual researcher. Um, that's a really excellent point about APCs, and I'm actually going to take this opportunity to plug CMU libraries. Um, if you are at CMU, we actually have a fund to help researchers pay APCs. Um, so if you don't know about that, you can just come talk to one of us, and we can um, help you out with that. Okay, um, any other questions for Gabriel? Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, you gave such a great talk that you've answered all of our questions, it seems. <laughs> um, I just, can you explain a little bit more, I know we were talking about this before, how the review process occurs. So, you send something to BioArchive, how does the review process there, and how do you take in that review process? To BioArchive, you mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, so for, for, for both steps, from BioArchive and then to PLSO. Yeah, so if you, pre if you, post in BioArchive, they offer you the opportunity to directly submit to a, a collection of biojournals, uh, including many of all of the journals in, in PLOS. Um, and BioArchive doesn't provide a formal peer review. Actually, they do not post, as far as I know, the final version. You can, uh, somebody this morning was saying that you can version so if your paper has been revised, you can update a newer version in BioArchive, but they do not allow posting of the final published version. So they are exclusively a pre-publication, preprint server. They don't provide, but they have a comment section where your peers can freely go and leave comments. So they offer you the, the opportunity to transfer directly to many journals, and if you do that, it depends on the journals whether they will take into consideration or not the comments that have been left in BioArchive. We do. Like, we go to BioArchive and read what people have left. Mostly it's useless, but we still do it. Uh, if you submit to us first, then you will be asked whether you want us to post your study in BioArchive. And it's up to you to say yes or no. If you say yes, then we will screen to know that if you do a human study, there are no identities, that if you do an ecology study, you are not reporting GPI locations or, sorry, GPS location of like endangered species and something like that. And then we will post it on your behalf. And during peer review, we will be checking the preprint to see if anybody has left comments. Um, Am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just wondering for those um, uh, those reports that nobody gave any review for. <laughs> uh, if that then you go and find reviewers. Yeah, yeah. We actually, I mean, we don't substitute whatever is left in BioArchive for selecting our own. The, your paper will still be formally peer reviewed by us. We reviewers that we select, in addition to whatever is in BioArchive. I'm just curious as far as the data availability statements that are in there, especially for like class medicine, where there's a statement that um, sharing can't happen because it's human data or things like that. But oftentimes there is an email um, contact um, put there that says, oh, reach out to this individual. Do they, do authors sign that they will keep that up to date or do you guys check those often or, or how, how is that? Um. Um, so yeah, we, as was mentioned uh, before this morning, like privacy uh, beats everything. Uh, so if there are legal or ethical restrictions on not sharing the data, we allow the authors to keep their data themselves and be contacted. Uh, there is a commitment a verbal or a written commitment that the authors will share the data, uh, but we don't have the power of enforcing, uh, and we don't do any follow-up. If, however, and this should apply for any journal, not only PLOS, uh, if you contact an author and is unwilling or unable to share the data, you can write to the editor. 
and then the editor must, it's part of our job. We have to follow up. Like if, and not only with data, with regions, if you want to use a published mouse or plasmi and the author is unwilling to share, you should reach to the editor and complain. And it is the editor's duty to go to the author, but we cannot enforce, you know? We can shame, but that's <laughs> as much as we can do. That being said, I think that BMC, are you familiar with that publisher? They retracted papers because the author didn't share the code. But the paper wasn't flawed. So. Great, any more questions for Gabriel? Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker then. Our next speaker will be Reinhard Schumacher from Carnegie Mellon's Department of Physics. since it uh, was established. So let's start with uh, the origins and evolution of the archive. Uh, these days it's called archive.org and it is an openly accessible, moderated repository for scholarly preprints or called ePrints in numerous disciplines. It was started in August of 1991 by a physicist, uh, Paul Ginsparg, when he was at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. He saw a need for um, bringing the distribution of uh, physics uh, preprints into the, uh, into the uh, internet age. And so 91, that was a few years after the internet was really established and uh, the first web browsers were, were floating around. And so he came up with this idea and he, and he just set it up himself. Um, this thing has a 24 hour a day submission and uh, announcement cycle. Uh, so this is something that people in my field certainly look at every single day to see what's new. Uh, it's, uh, they strive to be a permanent archive of uh, preprints and it's totally free for the, the user and it's uh, available uh, worldwide. Um, for its first years, it was uh, hosted at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and it was called xxx.lanl.gov, and it was complete with these uh, death heads here uh, as, as part of their uh, little logo. Um, in 19, uh, 2001, Ginspark moved to Cornell, and he took the uh, archive with him, and since a lot of people were upset about skulls, Nowadays, the uh, symbol is a smiley face. Um, say something now about the funding uh, uh, mechanism. So it's free for the users, right? But uh, last year, they had a, a budget of uh, just about a million dollars. And that money came from the Simons Foundation and from Cornell University Library. And uh, there are 206 member organizations that 
the, and the organizations pay anywhere from about a thousand dollars to about uh, forty six hundred dollars a year to be part of that that group. Okay, uh, I can't, don't ask me what the member organizations are, but you know it's the usual suspects, I assume, uh, large universities and, and so on. But anybody can use it. So it, it started out in physics in many branches. I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, very quickly, it was adopted in mathematics, computer science, more recently in quantitative biology, quantitative finance, statistics, electrical engineering, and system science. And very recently, some uh, economists have uh, started uh, depositing their preprints there as well. Uh, how is it organized? It's, it's really run by Cornell University. Uh, there's a, a scientific advisory board that has 13 members on it. I, I don't mean to say they're all at Cornell, but uh, uh, it's centrally organized from there. Each of the uh, subject areas has a subject advisory committee. For example, there are 10 of them in physics, and uh, Paul Ginsparg, the originator of the whole thing, is he's uh, still a member of this group and also of this group here. Uh, but uh, the archive policy decisions, they're ultimately made um, by the Corn uh, Cornell University Library Group. Um, I found out recently that they're actually moving. Uh, this is some internal thing at Cornell. They're moving from the library to something called the Cornell Computing and Information Science area. Okay, so that's supposed to be seamless, though, for, for the users. So when you go to the archive, uh, in physics, my field, for example, all these, all these bullet points here are uh, subfields of physics, astrophysics, condensed matter physics, general relativity, uh, high energy physics, uh, experiment, lattice phenomenology, theory, mathematical physics, nonlinear sciences, nuclear experiment, nuclear theory, everything else in physics, okay? And then, then off the page here is the next one, which is mathematics. I, I highlighted one here, so if, if, if I go into here and I want to know something about my field, high energy uh, physics experiment, and I just click on it, and um, I find out every day what the new submissions are in the last 24 hours. And uh, I highlighted one of them here from last Friday because, hey, I submitted a paper last Friday <laughs> with my graduate student. And, and so what you get is um, a title, uh, a title, uh, the lead authors, um, a one-line comment that says uh, what the thing is about. I mean, in this case, it was from an invited talk at a conference this past summer, and then the abstract. And so it goes. So now if you're interested in that title and abstract, you, you can click on this. And, and the actual PDF file will, will pop up on your screen. So it's extremely easy to use. Um, if you click on an author name, then you get a list of everything that that author has ever had his or her name on, uh, on the archive. Um, and so you can check the pedigree of uh, the people submitting, if you want. Um, in, in addition to navigating to this point, you can also set it up in the archive so that they actually send you email every morning with um, the titles and uh, abstracts of all the things from the last 24 hours. And so, so you don't have to go there. It can just plop into your mailbox every day and you can keep up to date or try, try to. Okay, um, now. The way the archive gets used, at least in physics, I, I, I heard in our last talk that maybe in biology it works a little bit differently. Um, so in physics, if you post a result to the archive, that determines your scientific priority. You do not have to get the paper published in an archival journal to beat the competition. Okay? That's different from the way it was years ago. Uh, you know, 30 years ago it was whoever got the archival publication into the archival journal published first, that was scientific priority. But nowadays, everybody uses the archive, and even though it's not final or official, if you put it there first, it's your baby. 
Um, I mentioned that uh, there are the daily postings that anybody can get. Now, another interesting thing is that the archive is, is moderated but not peer reviewed. That means that for each subject area, there is a, a group of um, people, and I, they're pretty much anonymous, I don't know who they are, for physics even, um, who actually look at each uh, preprint that comes in and decides whether or not it's uh, suitable for the particular um, uh, subheading that it was uh, submitted to. And so the, the moderators can uh, uh, you know, reclassify a preprint or they can um, reject it outright if it's just some you know, nonsense from some crackpot. <laughs> and this, you can imagine that leads to a little bit of uh, tension sometimes, uh, but, but this is not, again, it's not peer review. They're just looking to see if the thing fits sort of their format and is on topic. And, uh, and, and so um, that's, that's what they view their task as being in order for something to appear to appear on the on the archive, so not peer reviewed, but it's amazingly clean too, in the, in the sense that you don't find much nonsense on there, even though even though it's uh, you know wide open and it's it's almost wide open. Um, in 2004, they also uh, established a, a thing where where they have a, the notion of, of endorsed submitters. They started saying that anybody who submits to the archive has to be endorsed by somebody else who is already endorsed. So it's like a, a giant chain of uh, mutual endorsements. Um, this was viewed initially as maybe a problem for young scientists who uh, don't have a, an established reputation and they want to get their first paper in there. but. This, I would say, is sort of minimally enforced, as far as I can tell. If, if you submit a paper from a recognized university, uh, if, you're, if you're from Carnegie Mellon, and it's your first paper, they're not going to reject it. Um, so um, in, certainly in physics, and I expect it's true pretty much across the board, and we heard in the last talk a bit about uh, this. Um, uh, in physics, the archival journals like Physical Review and European Journal of Physics will accept manuscripts first posted on the archive for real peer review and for publication in, uh, in their journals. There are a few exceptions to that. I think nature and science, uh, they have um, rather strict rules about uh, having pre-release of the results, but certainly all the American Physical Society journals uh, will let you do that. Um, submission uh, uh, format is usually uh, uh, LaTeX, uh, or you can do it directly with a PDF. In terms of uh, copyrights, uh, the copyright is usually retained by the, the uh, authors, uh, but the archive makes you at least uh, say, give them a, what they call an exclusive irrevocable license to distribute preprints. There, there are some other uh, types of uh, rights, uh, things you can choose, uh, creative commons and so on, but usually you just give them their minimum uh, rights there and then they're happy. Um, also, no citation or download statistics are kept on the archive. So you cannot go back um, weeks or months later and see how many people in the world have downloaded your, your, your paper. That, that's sort of, uh, you know, as an author, oftentimes you'd like to know okay, who's reading my stuff, or how many people have read my paper. The archive does not offer that. It's just the way it is. Uh, so, uh, last couple of things. Uh, this, this shows how the growth has gone. On the left side here, this is 1991. Over here, this is 2017. The blue, as an example, that's, that's uh, high energy physics, the branch where uh, Inspar, you know, was trying to solve a problem, and he evidently did, but you can see that the, it, it's plateaued, and it's been plateaued for a long time. Uh, then condensed matter physics came along, they're the green, uh, the red, that's uh, astrophysics phenomenology. Um, this light blue one is pretty much all the rest of physics. 
uh, nuclear physics, general physics, and so on. The purple is uh, math. Uh, this, uh, whatever this color is, that's uh, computer science. And, uh, and these tiny slivers are newer things, uh, including biology. <laughs> Here. But I'm sure they'll grow as well. Uh, th on the right-hand side, this is just the fractional usage. So again, the blue is high energy physics. So even though they're constant in, in uh, more or less in submissions, their fraction of the entire uh, archive world is just uh, dropped as other people have joined in. And um, this is one more then. So within physics, there are these sub subdivisions, uh, you know, high energy theory, high energy phenomenology, uh, lattice, uh, experiment, uh, and again, the, the fractions of the total of that. Uh, one more example is for astrophysics. Uh, it used to be from 1993 to 2009, uh, astrophysics was just one, one big listing. And in that year, they switched and they started having all these subheadings. Uh, I, don't ask me to interpret these uh, descriptive things, but you know they just switched and they, they split it off into a bunch of different things that are more of topical interest. Okay, so in summary, uh, the archive is a free permanent repository of scholarly preprints. It's a moderated thing. It's not peer reviewed. Uh, postings are, it's, it's taken very seriously in the community uh, and the growth since 1991, it continues unabated and uh, even now new fields are joining uh, uh, this system of preprint distributions. So, thank you. For right here. I have more of a comment actually. The archive, in contrast to, for example, the bioarchive, doesn't uh, mint DOIs for the submissions. It costs money, and, and I think archive decided not to mint DOIs. And one of the issues that that raises for me personally is that I can't report. I, I, I'm allowed to report on my NIH progress reports on grants. I'm allowed to report preprints, but only if I can provide a DOI. So that kind of be, defeats some of the purposes. Yeah, I, I mean, there's some some physicists who who uh, ensue the entire publication circus, right? They publish their stuff on the archive, and they say, that's it. I put my stuff out into the world. I don't need it to be published in a, in a real... Uh, uh, journal, right? But then, if you're a young scientist and you're looking for uh, uh, support from a funding agency, they've got to agree with that argument, and, and they may not. Yeah. Um, uh, your comment makes me think too. Um, at least the, the physics archive does not accept comments. Our, our previous talk mentioned that uh, that uh, in biology you can put comments on the archive. That, that's absolutely not done for any of the physics fields. Uh, so it's really just a depository for, or repository for the preprints themselves. Uh, you can go back and change your metadata. So if you get a DOI and if, if you want to put it in there by hand into your listing, you, you can do it. Um, but uh, but that's, that comes when the paper appears in an archival journal. Do you have any other questions? Round of applause for all our speakers. <laughs> if they'd like to take a bar stool. Uh, well, one last round of questions. And um, as we get situated, I'll, I'll start it off. Um, with a question really for our first two speakers. Uh, as someone pointed out earlier, open has a lot of ramifications um, and it is sometimes poorly uh, understood or applied. But one thing about open science and open publishing is open reviewing. And there's been 
some real advances that eLife and Plus uh, Journals and others have really pushed. Uh, on one side, where do you see that advancing to? And also, I know there's plenty of pushback that says, as a junior investigator or as a woman investigator uh, or minority, that that because my identity might be known to the other reviewers, that I am not as forthcoming. Um, so what are the, some of the problems? What are some of the advances that we might see in the future of, uh, of really improving the peer review process? Uh, I mean, I think that there is also multiple understandings of what open peer review means. Uh, I think that eLife has been really innovative in that sense. I don't know if you're familiar. She's better placed to explain, but uh, they do a collaborative peer review in which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but every reviewer reads the manuscript, sends comments, and there is an editor that brings together the reviewers and they have a live conversation and try to reach a single joint review. And as far as I know, it's the only journal that does it. We don't do it. That's a form of open peer review. Another form will be forcing the reviewers to re reveal their identities to the author. Uh, the version that we hope to release in the second quarter of 2019 is publishing, which is something that ELAP also does, their reviewer comments. But there is no dialogue among them. We just collect this. Uh, my job as an editor is try to synthesize them, adjudicate, and write a decision. But that, that's my job. And then I release their comments, I release my decision, and I will publish the, the author's rebuttal. Um, so she can elaborate more on, on how uh, it works on eLife, but at least in this version, the junior, we will not ask the, it will be optative optional for the reviewer to sign their comments. We will publish the content, but not the identity. And uh, we don't think that we will, that that will uh, inhibit the reviewer or jeopardize their position. Um, and identity, again, will be optional. So in that sense, uh, I think they will be safe. And uh, it is, it will be on the authors to decide at the end of the whole process whether they want the reviews to be published or not. So uh, the opt-in will be at the very final step. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as Gabriel mentioned, uh, in eLife we have this consultative peer review process and this goes kind of in line with one of the points you made, which is, so at this point all the reviewers can see each other's reviews and they can participate in a discussion led by the eLife editor. And actually we run a webinar for early career researchers last week, and we sent a survey in advance, uh, kind of to get a feeling of how their experience had, had been if they had reviewed a paper for eLife. And in most cases, they indicated that they put a lot of effort in writing the review, but then when it came to uh, having that discussion, some of them were really honest in saying, oh, obviously I felt a bit intimidated by seeing a lot of senior people in that conversation. And uh, that kind of, I didn't feel as comfortable in making the stance I, I would like to um, because of, of the seniority of the other people involved. Uh, but I think that's, that this shouldn't be an argument against open peer review. Obviously, there's something we are aware of. So actually, I was just discussing this at lunchtime with one of our editors who's based this here at Carnegie Mellon. And he was saying that he had a similar case in a recent manuscript he handled. And what he thought he would do would be to just have a separate conversation with the, the junior researcher and kind of encourage him to make the point he wished he made and kind of well, just give that uh, kind of that security that he would also uh, support uh, the, his, like the sense he, 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 he wanted to make. Um, and just kind of to, to collaborate with something Gabriel also mentioned, there are various um, descriptions of what open peer review could be. And one really innovative peer review kind of approach to open peer review is also the F1000 model of post-publication peer review. And I think that 
we are all aware that open peer review is here, and I think we all agree that that's probably the way to move things forward. And it will be interesting to see how each one, each publisher, kind of decide to take its own approach. Just to round up, I think that I mean we are all very aware. We don't want to jeopardize anybody. We don't want to uh, uh, hurt the authors or hurt their reviewers. So uh, we we do have these discussions and and try to make. Uh, steps forward carefully. So a few weeks ago at the National Library of Medicine, we ran this workshop with a bunch of data scientists, and we tried to reproduce about 12 papers. And uh, we learned a lot of interesting things. But one of the things we learned was abundantly clear, is that none of the reviewers had ever tried to run the code in any of the papers. So do you guys have any experience or uh, ideas about how to get reviewers to test code that is submitted in computational papers. Um, yeah, so actually I think that, yeah, someone in the audience has asked me a similar question. So I think, obviously, this is something that we, unfortunately, we cannot enforce. We can encourage, and for example, checklists may be a good way to encourage reviews to do that. Or, for example, when I, for each more kind of computational oriented paper to make sure that the journal tries to recruit someone with the right expertise to run the code and see if actually the statements that are made in the paper comply with the data and the, the, the code that was used to process it. Uh, and there are tools, for example, like GoDotion, I appreciate that it will be here tomorrow, that could help facilitate in the, re the review process in that sense. I honestly don't know how much reviewers are familiar with using GoDotion. But I think it's it's a great tool for that purpose. Yeah, oh, actually, I think I'm, I'm not sure if it is F1000, but I, I'm pretty sure there is at least one journal or more already using Code Ocean. Um, I'm not sure if it is integrated in the review process or that there is, there are conversations around that. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries. I'm the guy that Rebecca introduced as the librarian that doesn't like books. You can discern from that what you wish. Uh, Anne was surprised that I was using slides. I didn't plan to use slides, but there were a couple of pretenders this afternoon who seemed to think that they could squeeze more slides per minute into a presentation <laughs> than I can, and I didn't want the opportunity to compete um, go by. That said, I am conscious that I stand between you and speed dating. And at a time when Carnegie Mellon is about to um, release its consensual relations policy, I don't want to get in the way or get caught up in that at all. Uh, when I looked at the delegates list, I realized there were a bunch of people from Carnegie Mellon, some of whom probably spend their lives in labs in this building. There were a bunch of people from Pitt. And you may never have been on the main campus at Carnegie Mellon. Um, there it is. Uh, just by way of orientation for those of you from out of town, we are currently in a building round about here, yeah, thereabouts. Uh, Pitt and UPMC are around there, and the big massive bit in the foreground is Carnegie Mellon. Uh, those of you who don't know much about the university may not know that it, it was founded in 1900 by Andrew Carnegie. In 1967, we merged, or Carnegie Institute merged, with the Mellon Institute based in this building. So a lot of Scottish heritage both on the Carnegie and the Mellon side, a lot of Scottish symbols on campus, 
this is outside my office. Um, quite seriously, it packs back pipes outside my office. Uh, one of the, the curious things about this whole Scottish thing is there's a clause in the faculty handbook that nobody really has grasped apart from me that anybody from the faculty speaking in public has to do so with a Scottish accent. Uh, I've been practicing for five years. I'm really from Wisconsin, but I'm getting there. Uh, we're in this building, as you've probably worked out, having uh, come in this morning. Again, those of you not from CMU may not appreciate that quite seriously, this building was Gotham City Town Hall in the Batman movies. Uh, so there you are. And that's a CMU uh, graduate, I think, playing Batman. Yeah, so open science is um, what we're here talking about today. It really has become significant over the last few years. For me, being a Brit, the real marker that something is important is when the Royal Society actually publish publishes a report saying this is a thing because they've kind of been around for a few hundred years and they're slow to, to grasp things. Um, but really, you know, just looking at the number of reports coming out from the National Academies, OECD and others, really shows that policymakers have grasped what all of you have been doing in your daily jobs for years. And I think there's a recognition that those who pay for research expect that they will have access to the products of the research they fund. There's a growing expectation, as we've heard several times today, around reproducibility and accountability, partly to minimize errors, partly to tackle the nasty questions around scientific misconduct, partly to have fun with all of your hacking and coding. Uh, and also, I think, in society at large, we recognize that the internet has democratized many aspects of our lives. And it's not at all unreasonable to expect science to be just as visible, just as accessible. And it's also important for researchers, particularly at the beginning of their careers, that they can take open science approaches and increase their visibility and build their reputation. One of the products of open science has been a whole host of open science tools. You can begin to map these out and pick your pathway for particular approaches. Um, you could spend hours having fun like this, and you can do so when you're speed dating later on. But open science, I was just sitting here today. I, I don't often spend a lot of time in this library. It's usually in and out. But as I was looking around, it made me remember that open, you know, science has always been open. Research is from the earliest days of journals, 350 years ago, have wanted their work to be known, to shape science, to build reputations. And really, somebody made the point earlier about citations and impact factors. And I think it was really the arrival of the impact factor, which was an unexpected product of Gene Garfield's citation index that changed things, because all of a sudden, journals that societies around the world had published to foster open communication among scientists between members became commercial commodities. The commercial publishers were able, when the impact factor started to be uh, published in the 60s, they were able to rank journals. Whether you believe in the impact factor, whether you try and game it, I'm not getting into that debate, but quite simply, the impact factor introduced some form of ranking. It was like a fantasy journal league. And <laughs> that um, turned journals into commodities. Publishers realized that they could buy the best ones, give the societies a few thousand dollars, make them feel they've done a great deal, and then squeeze billions out of libraries in the 30, 40 years since. And that has really transformed how people communicate. And if you look, this is a, a, a post talking about the oligopoly of publishing. Uh, the, the critical thing here is the red line. So back in 1970, in, uh, in the 70s, about 80% of um, articles published in natural and medical sciences went to publishers other than the big four or five. Look at it now, it's down in 2015 or thereabouts to about 45% and a similar pattern in the social sciences. So it's, it's just one of the things that has really squeezed openness because everything's behind a paywall. Here at Carnegie Mellon, we spend about $7 million a year on journal subscriptions, buying back the stuff that you've published. Perhaps the one good thing to have come out of this is a recognition from, pub, from the academy that this is unfair and that we need to do things differently. 
But again, thinking uh, as I looked at the um, collections and, and the stacks here, it, it made me realize over the course of the day that really from my side of the business, what we're talking about is in part the scholarly record. And what I'm really thinking about in the context of a discipline is what matters and what is useful to researchers and scholars. Now, to an extent, what constitutes the record, what designates the publications that form the scholarly record, has been one of the library's primary functions. Um, to an extent, what it's been what we have added to our collections that make a difference. Of course, we listen to scholars. We sometimes even act upon what scholars tell us. But at the end of the day, it's been what us librarians have done that, frankly, has mattered. But that's a dirty secret that we don't talk about too often. But the scholarly record has shifted. It's gone away from what you see around you in this building to something that is now almost exclusively made up of digital objects and digital documents. We used to focus on the outcomes in the middle, the books, the journals, the um, end of project reports. But now we look at the products of the research process, the protocols and methods, the community conversations, the evidence that is gathered. And after the research has been concluded, the community discussion, the revisions, the reuse of data, code, publications, and so on. And we're seeing that expanding because digital documents, digital objects are cheap and easy to replicate and deliver. But we're also beginning to see the use of machines in analyzing and extending the scholarly record. Um, one of the challenges for people in my business now is how we try and help the scholarly community uh, capture and curate what's important, not fuss about what's not important, and navigate what it is that we curate. That's another presentation, two minutes. Uh, I was going to thank you at the end for not timing me. But, okay, and so I'm going to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to speed up. Uh, so the objects that document the research process are in increasingly openly visible, and there's a huge amount of stuff to capture and curate. Storing valuable research data is an important endeavor, but it's not going to be the librarians who succeed in this venture because we will not do that better than the high performance computing centers. We need to collaborate with them and get on with it. So that takes us to the event where the CMU Libraries and the Mellon College of Science collaborated to host this important event today. I want to share a few broad reflections, which is what I was asked to do, but I couldn't resist some personal reflections first. <coughs> These are not comprehensive, it's just a few highlights of things that struck me. Um, I'd be like um, Lucy in Anisha's video if I tried to grab everything and spit it back to you. So, some thoughts. Um, academic tribes and territories has been one of the recurring themes of today. Uh, as I think about the key players, their funders uh, have come up repeatedly. They can encourage, even force, change in our behaviors. If a funder says, we will give you a grant, but a trade-off of that is you make your data available for others to reuse, or you publish an open access journal, or whatever else it is, they can drive a lot of change. Uh, we see huge partnership between uh, researchers and funders, particularly in Europe, kind of less so in this country, but I'm still navigating the US political landscape coming to that. Um, institutions need to think about the reward processes. What does it mean to get promotion, tenure, and so on? And is it time to give up on the traditional expectations of markers of scholarly achievement? And in, in disciplines, we also see um, some drivers around preprints, data archives, and such things. Um, we also heard about citizen science, which kind of sits outside the academic tribes and territories, but there's an increasing alliance between those in the academy and those outside who are interested and able to contribute to what we do. We've heard also a lot about workflows and tools. My big takeaway, I said to Anna that I need to go and take a software carpentry course because I've been promised a better job. Um, <laughs> another big point that we need to hammer to everyone is sharing data is not particularly useful, it's reusing data that is useful. Grabbing data by pointing and clicking doesn't equal reproducibility. 
Uh, we need to build our websites tomorrow, zappos.com, but who's the shoes was another takeaway. Uh, a lot of, also about observatories, and, and that's a, a really important point that I haven't reflected much on uh, before today. Uh, I often talk about the fourth industrial revolution in the context of libraries and open science. We also heard about the four research paradigms and data-driven discovery being the fourth paradigm. Um, some interesting questions around who owns data code, research outputs, when, if ever, do they expire? Uh, we need to push for open file formats. We heard also about reproducibility. I like the fix share tagline as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, the central motivation for the scientific method is to root out error. How does open science help that happen? Uh, Victoria presented some interesting reproducibility enhancement principles. How do we have a conversation about those? We've heard also about open access. Some of my colleagues get excited about the open access movement. I hate to dispel that myth and actually point out that it's a business model, not um, a movement. And simply, it's a shift in the burden of cost um, where we don't charge readers or libraries for the first copy and infrastructure costs. Um, We've heard about the advantages of open access to researchers, funders, and the rest of the academic tribe and territory. Um, we, I, I also really was struck this morning by the importance of open source, both in, in terms of programs and the hardware, and how that makes science affordable for those who don't have national labs on their doorsteps. We also um, heard a nod towards Plan S, the European Union's attempt to conquer the world of publishing. It's quite exciting this week that the architect of Plan S is in Washington. Uh, according to Nature, he's going to the White House and they're waiting for him already uh, <laughs> with great excitement to figure out how the US can do Plan S. It ain't going to happen. Uh, we heard, we, we've touched around the margins. What are the impediments to open science? The restrictions on data reuse, how researchers want to make additional discoveries with their own data and not share it with others. Uh, there's some commercial impediments around the, the publishers that we're trying not to talk too much about. Um, the overhead in data curation, how long does a researcher take to organize data, assign metadata, describe their data so that others can reuse it? How can those of us on my side of the shop help with that process? How do we make available useful forms of storage? National Academies, as you're probably aware, released a report a few weeks ago, Open Science by Design, uh, really worth reading. Um, I'm not going to critique it or summarize it here, but if you haven't read it, the URL is there. Uh, my quote of the day, Open Science is honorable, Open Science is strategic. Uh, what would you like to do next? Is this a one-off event where you now go and date and you go off and do whatever you want to do and that's the end of it. Do you want another symposium like this maybe next year? Do we want hackathons, any other sort of thon? Uh, what about software training, software carpentry to get better jobs, collaboration and incubator events? You know, we'd love to hear from you, find out who's interested in this. We'll gather your feedback. Um, we want to know some of these things. But did you meet new people that you will collaborate with? Did you try out new tools? Whatever. Carnegie Mellon folks, your library is here to help you. Forget about the papery things around here, Rebecca was spot on. Uh, we are trying to rebuild a library that can help you navigate the open science tools that are out there. We've got experts, many of them sitting around here and in the back of the room who can help you. Many of them come from your disciplines. They will be delighted to come and make machines that go ping, go ping in your labs and talk to you about your information activities. That's our fixture instance for those who weren't aware of it. Uh, a few thank yous um, from the University Library team, Melanie, Anna, Ajin, Jessica for timekeeping and not waving a time at me more than once, Eric uh, from the College of Science. So all of our local organizers, our sponsors, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and reception. I don't really, I need, I need just one slide for a few thank yous. Okay, well these are our sponsors which, which uh, keep just uh, thanks, but I'll reiterate our thanks for them. I wanna thank all of you for attending too. I know it's hard to get, um, you know, put aside what you're doing on a Thursday and come here to listen to this, um, but I really hope this is starting to build more of a community. I hope this um, today and the discussions after at the reception and tomorrow's workshops um, inspire some new ideas and we would really love to hear what comes out of this and what you want to hear next. Those of you at CMU, certainly um, get in touch with any of us. Um, we'll probably send you a survey um, <laughs> to all of the attendees, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I want to thank the, um, other, all the other supports that the four of us uh, who organized the event have had from the libraries, uh, from the Mellon College, our, our promotion and design team, Shannon, Heidi, Gigi, Al, um, our admin support in the libraries, booked our guest hotel rooms and uh, helped us with uh, catering orders and all of that, um, our donor um, relations, um, and then Ben, who's going to help you with the scientific speed dating in just one minute, um, and as well as uh, many others who jumped in uh, so man our registration table and on all other sort of odd jobs. Uh, thank you very much for helping us uh, make today and tomorrow possible. Oh, that's the end of the slides, okay. A um, couple of other brief announcements. Tomorrow's workshops, um, they are in your program. They are on the event website. There is walk-in space available. If any of you would like to attend, um, just let us know. Uh, we'd be glad to have you uh, at noon to two tomorrow. There's free lunch, uh, coupled with a Figshare and Kilt Hub deposit-a-thon. You can deposit your data on the fly or just talk to us about maybe what sort of data or code you might be interested in sharing and enjoy a sandwich with us. Um, and those events, uh, the lunch and the workshops, will all be on the third floor of this building near where you came in at the Belfield Street entrance, not in this library tomorrow. Although feel free to come up if you'd like to just enjoy the space. Um, make sure you take a mug. We have many. Um, take one for your children. <laughs> Two for your children. Um, enjoy and reminisce back on the event. We ordered 12 dozen. Um, <laughs> the reception is next. Good news. There's wine and beer, as well as other drinks and snacks and an hors d'oeuvre spread. Uh, during the reception, Ben will uh, lead us through the speed dating. Uh, the reception runs until 6.30, uh, but we encourage you to continue your discussions, you know, form informal groups, go out to dinner, especially for those of you who are uh, from out of town or who would like to speak to those who are here from out of town, graciously visiting us, uh, and those of uh, us on the committee are happy to provide any restaurant recommendations. So, without further ado, Ben, there are dating instructions. All right, this is really, really simple. Um, we first read this at uh, a Great Lakes uh, ISCB meeting. Um, if you're interested in running this at your own institution, uh, we actually managed to publish this in F1000, and it is indexed in PubMed. Uh, so you can look up scientific speed dating. But it's really simple. So basically, we will go and get in the beer line. Once the beer line is, uh, uh, once everybody has a beer, uh, everybody who wants a beer has a beer, uh, then we will, uh, there are eight people who are presenting software that they built. Uh, everybody will spend three minutes um, at a given table, so they will set up with placards at various tables. You go around, hear them pitch their software for three minutes, you'll have one minute to ask questions, and then we will rotate tables until each person that came to present their software has presented their software to more or less everybody. Does everybody understand? Are there any questions? Relatively simple. Yeah? Everybody good? And I will tell you, of course I will tell you when we're starting and when to move. Yeah? All right? Presenters, people who are presenting software, they know what they're doing. You got a pitch? We'll get you your placard. You will get your placards from these people. All right, great. Let's go have beer. Thank you.